Hi sir, welcome to Behind the Bar and thank you so much for agreeing to be on the part of our show and this is our last episode sir, so we could not have had anyone better than you to be there on our finale episode. So sir, uh, my first question to you is, and I go back down the memory lane as I speak to you, uh, when I was 10 years old, that, that was the first time when I saw you and it was in Hyatt Regency, there was, it was a ballroom and you were dancing with Babsi Ma'am. That's what I remember. And at that time, because I was so small, I did not know that, you know, you're one of the top lawyers. But the way you met me and you were winking at me in a very cute way. And you said that, you know, uh, love is a very important part of a human being's life. So that has stayed with me since the last 15, 16 years. So my first question to you is, sir, how, what do you think about love and what role has it played in your journey? Well, I'm very glad. It's a very unusual question, but I'm very glad you asked it because Yes, my memory does go back. I, I remember seeing you very small. Uh, but I must tell you that the dancing steps were first taught to me by my wife. Okay. Yeah, I taught her how to drive a car and she taught me how to dance. <laughs> so, so we exchanged. Uh, it was a good, uh, useful exchange. But I danced very badly. <laughs> okay. okay. And so and although she drove pretty well. <laughs> and so what uh, what weightage do you give to love in your life? Oh, tremendous, tremendous. I, I mean, that's, that's the only thing that's uh, the, the oil in the system, as it were, that's, uh, which uh, helps people along. Uh, if only there could be more love and affection uh, around the world, uh, we'd be in a much better state of affairs. But unfortunately, we are not. Everybody just wants something, you see. So. It becomes very difficult. Okay, sir. So, so I would like to start from the beginning, yeah. uh, from the days of Rangoon. So, if you can tell us if you have some fond memory of what was happening during the Second World War and when you had to shift, sir. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Actually, uh, I was born in uh, Rangoon in Burma and uh, my father worked there for the New India Assurance Company. and. Uh, he was quite a prominent person in social life. So he was also on the governor's council, the, the governor of Burma. The governor was an English one. And uh, the, he then asked the governor that whether we could, should, after the bombing in Rangoon, which was quite frequent, that we should go up to Mandalay for a while. Oh, he said, perfectly all right, Sam, he told my father. Uh, we'll throw the Japanese out, but instead the Japanese threw the British out. And when we went off to Mandalay, the road was cut off. So we were forced to then go beyond and go overland into India, which took about 21 odd days. And that was another great story. But uh, we experienced quite a lot. And uh, I think that uh, in retrospect, it was uh, it was uh, it helped helped me to understand that your possessions mean very little in this world. You can't take it with you. In fact, uh, we left everything in Rangoon, in Burma, for, and uh, and this happened even twice in 25 years because after my father died and he was buried in Rangoon, my mother came out to Bombay and she brought a few things uh, to the airport, but she was not allowed to take them out. So. Twice in 25 years, we left everything that we had in Burma. But it was a very, very fine country and very nice people. But unfortunately, they are in a very bad way today. Okay, sir. And sir, uh, would you like to tell us something about the 21 day? Uh, ah, yeah, that, that was quite, quite an experience because uh, there were no tourist uh, <laughs> resorts then. There was no, nobody could fashion your tour and find out how you are going because nobody knew how you were going. So we had to do all sorts of things, go f just follow, follow a, a crowd of people who were leaving Burma. And uh, we trekked for so about eight, five or six days. Then we had to go by a boat in the Chindwin River, upper Chindwin River, which was all very scenic and very beautiful. But at that time, of course, it was very difficult. And then we spent uh, also about almost a week on bullock carts. 
and the bulakat owner because i knew burmese so i would speak to him in burmese a little so he was very happy and he told my mother that oh i like your son very much but but that got, that frightened my mother because it, she thought i'd be kidnapped uh, overnight or some such thing and it was quite quite an experience because uh, even when we went by bullock cart ours was a lead cart and at night we'd all it, uh, they couldn't travel at night so they would all come to an opening and all the men would sit around and keep vigil because there were animals and nobody knew what would happen but of course i went to sleep in the bullock cart so there was no difficulty and uh, there and uh, he, he kept uh, he, he was very fond of little jujubes or sweets that we had brought from rangoon he had never seen them and he told my mother that i like your son very much and my mother got even more frightened because she thought that this was the end and i, I would definitely be kidnapped but nothing of the sort happened he was a very kindly old fellow he was our, the man who, who was in charge of our bullock cart and then of course we came came overland uh, tamu palel unto manipur after 21 days we, i mean we had our first hot meal actually because we were living on biscuits and a uh, little bits of exchange of whatever atta or, or, or roti or somebody think that could have come <laughs> anyway it was quite an experience uh, the only thing it of course taught me that is never to yearn for anything too much in life it's not not worth it right sir sir so uh, then you came to india so so how did law come into your mind i always wanted to ask you this <laughs> by default okay because uh, actually my father wanted me to uh, go for the ics uh, in, but in those days for for the india in, in indian civil service you had to go to london to give your final exam <coughs> and i knew my father couldn't afford it at that time so uh, I, so uh, so we, we just happened to go to college and uh, ultimately uh, and uh, i was pretty poor in mathematics and knew very little science so the next best thing was to take law because and it's it's the same sort of thing today also a lot of people come into the legal profession merely because they don't know which other profession to adopt or to take because it's uh, perhaps uh, the more inviting and uh, the least uh, the least uh, uh, enthusiastic and the uh, least thing which you can you look with with enthusiasm so, so when you took law at that time you did not have any like uh, you were not you took it not thinking that what you were going to do in uh, no of course not yeah correct because because i passed out with my ba with economics honors with second class and uh, then of course when i went to law of course it was all very different i was very successful and so on but uh, that uh, that comes af after a while okay so so in your initial days sir i wanted to ask you that if you can tell us something about your mentors mr nani palki wala yeah oh yes 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 they were all very i actually i i was very fortunate because i joined the chamber which is sir jamse ji kanga's chamber which was the best chamber in that one could join in bombay and uh, this was only because my father's uh, the chairman of the new india assurance company was a man called mr daji who was uh, the senior partner in pain and company that's a solicitors firm in bombay and uh, he so my father asked him to put me up in jamse ji's chamber and he very kindly went and spoke to jamse ji and uh, the old man of course was very kind and took me in uh, in his chamber and after that of course i never looked back but it was a chamber which was <coughs> which had a lot of uh, a lot of movement and a lot of uh, verve and a lot of because there were very successful lawyers all around not only palke wala palke wala was the, amongst the junior most at that time there were a lot of senior lawyers there was mr sirway there was mr mystery a lot of other people kola with whom i i uh, studied i mean worked with in the in the chamber for a while and of course we had no chair or table to sit on or no no chair to sit on, no table to work on or any such thing we used to work go up to the library and work 
and Nani, of course, was uh, was just had just started in his profession, but he was ex doing extremely well. And he was uh, he happened to be my part-time professor also in the government law college, mm -hmm. and so and so was uh, Chief Justice Chandrachud, who later became Chief Justice here, Yashwan Chandrachud. He was also my professor in the government law college, and they were all outstanding. And it was because they made law so import, not only important, but so, so wonderful to adopt, so that we thought that there was nothing else to do but, to, but uh, follow the law and uh, do, do exactly as they had said, because they were brilliant professors. And uh, we, uh, one of the great uh, ach achievements, I think, of my life has been to understand how to, how well one can teach law, and and and, and uh, later my son when he went to, when Rowington went to Harvard, he told me of course he had brilliant professors also there, and uh, it always shapes your mind, shapes your destiny as to how you do in the future. That's right. And sir, any interesting anecdote of your early days of work which you would like? Oh yeah, plenty of them. I've written all about them. I've forgotten most of them, <laughs> but they are all full of uh, full uh, because I've uh, written a great deal more about them. Yeah. Okay. And sir, uh, so sir, after that you were offered the position of additional solicitor general of India. Oh, that was much later, much later. Before that, I was offered uh, to a, a judgeship in the High Court, right. actually, but. It was uh, especially that Chief Justice uh, uh, of India wrote apparently to the Chief Justice of Bombay at that time, Justice Kotwal, and uh, that I should be appointed because I was very young, much less than 40, and uh, at that time they never took anybody beyond, unless you were at least 40, I was about 37 or 38. But then in those days, I had my grandmother to support and so on, so it was not feasible. And, and uh, salaries were still, uh, at the time of the Constitution, 3,500 or something, which I knew that it couldn't be afforded. And we had left everything twice in so many years in Burma, so we were not so well off. So I had to decline. But of course, much to my regret, but uh, anyway, that's how we, we managed to. So, so then, when did you finally move to Del Delhi? Ah, uh -huh. move to Delhi was uh, that was when uh, in 1972 May, when I was offered the post of there was only uh, one additional solicitor general's post, and I was offered that by the law minister, Mr. Gokhale, H.R. Gokhale at that time. And uh, uh, then I moved to Delhi, but I, that was not very well received in Delhi because uh, the people, the lawyers in Delhi were not very happy that some fellow from Bombay, some upstart from Bombay who happened to be a favorite of the law minister was suddenly brought in as a, a law officer, third law officer of the government. But uh, of course, uh, they were all very good to me afterwards. They were, uh, they were, it, was, it was a very good experience to have. Very good experience, and I have never regretted coming to Delhi because I, I enjoy everything, all all my colleagues, etc. I've made a lot of friends and so on, and uh, now that I'm over ninety, uh, even a few enemies that I had, they are all dead. <laughs> okay, okay, sir. And so, so uh, what exactly happened, and why did you decide to resign from? Bigger one. Ah, resign was that because uh, that was a problem because. You see, my uh, it was a, a, a peculiar thing because uh, j just before, just uh, before, j somewhere in the vacation, in the June, May, June, uh, my wife and I we went by train to Bombay just for a few couple of weeks holiday, <coughs> and at that time, <coughs> I read in the. In, the, in an evening paper there, that the Home Secretary of the Government of India had been transferred and a new Home Secretary from Rajasthan had assumed charge. I thought nothing of it, it must be just a routine, but it wasn't, it wasn't, as we found out later, because all preparations were being made 
for the emergency at that time because Mrs. Gandhi had lost her case in the, as a parliamentarian in the Allahabad High Court and there was a lot of to and fro as to what should happen and the matter came up ultimately as you know before Justice Krishna Iyer as a vacation judge. In fact, much later when I came to know Krishna Iyer very well, I used to tell him that you have brought on the emergency because, because he did not grant her a total stay. He only granted her a right to go, be in parliament and speak in parliament but not to vote, which was quite demeaning for a prime minister. But anyway, that was how it was. But he, uh, he was a very fine, upright judge. And uh, ultimately, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that ultimately led to the emergency, which was at that time, of course, we were all very worried about the whole thing. But and at that time, I was in Bombay, so I sent a one-line letter of resignation, uh, which, of course, uh, we, to the law minister, and uh, there was a lot of criticism that why is this st silly fellow at such a young age resigning uh, for this reason. But I, I knew that I would not be able to, uh, I mean, defend all the the things that would happen, and and they did happen after after during the emergency. And fortunately, I did resign, and uh, uh, and that of course in a way helped my career later on, but much later, much later. And sir, and sir you were also a member in the Rajya Sabha. Ah, that came many, much later, much later. I wanted to ask you, so what do you think about the ways of the functioning of the parliament? Oh no, it was excellent at my time. I, 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 I had a great time in parliament. I, I was a nominated member and I was, and I, 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 I spoke very often on bills, on various matters. <coughs> and. Uh, um, uh, our chairman was uh, Mr. Shekhawat, who was then vice president, and he was very fond of me, and he would call upon me to assist him in various matters and so on. And I, I found a great. Uh, it's, but you see, the first uh, first year, year or two in parliament, I thought I'd do law as well as attend to parliament. But then I found that uh, both my both these. Uh, these uh, these professional uh, uh, accomplishments of mine would suffer, and they did suffer. So after a year or two, I decided that no, one can't do both together. So I then, uh, for a while, uh, thought that my practice could wait for, because I'd come back to a practice. And then I uh, devoted entirely the entire time to Parliament whenever it sat. It of course didn't sat to sit for more than about 100 days a year. But then that was, they were very, very revealing, very good days. And I made a lot of friends, knew a lot of people. And I particularly was uh, greatly enamored of uh, Mr. Vajpayee, one of the great prime ministers that we've had. Because he had, he had a great sense of dedication to India and uh, I had quite admired him. He was a good person. That's so. And uh, I spent uh, my entire six-year term in Parliament and I found it uh, extraordinarily useful for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, sir. And sir, which case according to you is your most personally satisfying case? Oh, I don't know. Oh. Quite frankly, I don't know. I am not, I still don't know. Uh, of course, there are many cases that we did and uh, uh, but you see, in a, in a case, uh, the, the satisfaction in a case is <coughs> not whether you win. Uh, of course, uh, winning is, course, of course is, is uh, very important. That's the aim, that's the object to win the case. But you can't win anyhow. You, you have to g give off your best. And sometimes, and many or many or often uh, when I now reflect and go back, I find that some of the cases that I lost, perhaps I did better than some of the cases where I won. So it all depends, it all depends. Okay, sir. And sir, uh, what your message would be for the future generation lawyers of the country? Oh yeah, you have to slog like hell. <laughs> that, that's the message. Okay. You, you, it, 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 there's no, 
there's no uh, uh, there's no rosy path to fame i mean a lot of people do get on just because of various connections and so on but that's not the way to get on but that because you fall off after a while and if you really want to keep we become a lawyer of some standing and uh, it's very important to dedicate yourself to work because it's a, it's a it's a grueling profession but it's a very rewarding profession at the end and success lies of course at the end not at the beginning at the beginning you have to slog a, a lot and reading a great deal knowing attending court particularly attending and see how seeing how others argue and how not to argue is also a lesson to learn from how, from watching people speak etc so that's a, that's a great lesson and at least uh, i have found it uh, very rewarding very rewarding that's why i miss uh, <coughs> last two three years after covid i miss uh, going to courts <coughs> Right. So my question to you here is that after COVID, sir, you've seen that a lot of uh, cases have now shifted to being online. Bigger yes. one? Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I do go online occasionally, but appear in court because uh, uh, and I, uh, online. But I find it uh, not half as rewarding as being in court itself. Right, sir. Do you think this can replace the uh, the the physical appearance like we used to have? No, no, it it, it cannot. But it helps a great deal because. it prevents the supreme court from moving right. you see because in those days in my days they used to always we always used to say that there should be uh, uh, the so court should uh, move both to the to the east especially the northeast and then also to the south but now it becomes unnecessary with uh, with this uh, this uh, new way of uh, of arguing cases which which is and i think that perhaps has helped a great deal and now that i read the other day that the chief justice is very keen to have the continue these virtual hearing whenever it becomes whenever it's necessary so that people from all parts of india can approach the highest court while sitting in their own uh, small towns and wherever they are which is a great great boon great boon right yes, sir And sir, do you think that the teachers of our country, the who, the teachers, teachers, ah, the teachers, poor chaps, are never, are never, are never treated well. Right. And unlike uh, the professors in America and England, where, where they are looked upon uh, as uh, as uh, academics of great quality. In fact, I was very keen that an academic uh, who was not a practicing lawyer should be appointed to the Supreme Court, but somehow. when i told justice venkatesh chala chala was chief justice he disagreed he says that no a person who has to practice and once he practices only he is fit to be a judge of the court i mean that was his view right so so but uh, do you think that the teachers get Im- the enough importance and no not at all not at all teachers unfortunately they they don't uh, they don't in fact when, when i first came to delhi i i used to find uh, a, A, f- a fellow driving a very old uh, 1920 uh, Austin yes and it was written at the back i i still remember this that please overtake me it said as all my students have right please overtake me as all my students have <laughs> so that uh, that that's the that's the nemesis for some f- professor who's done so well uh, taught a whole generation of students and yet his students have always overtaken him right sir right. and sir uh, do you think in india that the poor man today is getting justice ah uh, well it's a very de- difficult question a doubtful question it all depends you see uh, the i think uh, unless and until we have uh, uh, in, in the first place we are far too many people please remember that when the constitution was drafted uh, we were just uh, Three, thirty, thirty, three. How many? Thirty million people. Right. Yeah, and now of course it goes to thirteen hundred million people. I mean, they they were. It's not that we are overpopulated, but then you see, there was a time at which there was some problem about population to control it. Mr. J R D Tata was very interested in that project, but somehow the governments were not interested because. 
every new person who came up was, meant one more vote. So the vote banks increased tremendously with, with this increase of population. And therefore, I'm, I'm afraid we are, uh, the, the, the poor have, um, well, if they have not remained poor, they have, the rich have become much richer right. in our country today, in the last 10 years, for instance. And that, the statistics show that. Whereas the poor have not become richer. Right. That's, that's perhaps the better way to put it. It's not that they have become poorer, but they have not certainly become richer as the rich have, because we have multiplied with millionaires and billionaires and so on and so forth. But it's a very, very sad state of affairs that we have today. And all this business of socialism in our constitution, socialist, is really not practiced. <coughs> It's really a capitalist uh, form of, of uh, society. Right, so, so because the gap between the rich and poor has increased. Oh, tremendous. has increased tremendously, tremendously. And uh, I don't know, uh, they have not found any, we have not found any, any way in which to alleviate that, alleviate that. And especially you, you, we hear all sorts of injustices done in the smaller towns, smaller places. Not that they intentionally, but certainly people don't get the justice that they deserve. That, that's, that's the problem. That's the problem. And therefore, there's much work to be done by lawyers, by judges, by courts, uh, by politicians particularly. Uh, but, but somehow, uh, I don't know, there are too many different angles to things. Okay, sir. And sir, uh, what do you think about the collegium system? <coughs> And do you well, think it's at the moment it's about the best that, that can be done, but uh, but uh, I always prefer what, what uh, Justice Venkatachala had suggested when he was chairman of the of the National Committee to look into review the Constitution, because he his proposal of a National Commission was very simple. There should be five in a National Commission, okay. of which should consist of the three senior most judges of the Supreme Court. One person as the, either the law minister or his nominee, and one eminent person to be chosen by both the prime minister and the leader of the opposition. That was a, somehow an ideal choice. But, uh, but and actually, the, 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 there was a bill by the, by the former NDA government years ago, 2003, I think it was, uh, which actually tried to bring that into force, and the bill was introduced. But unfortunately, it lapsed because elections were called. And then it has never seen the light of day. And then the, the new bill that came in, which got defeated later, I appeared against it, actually, was, uh, was uh, totally skewed differently. It was worded very differently. There was a six-member committee which, uh, with, uh, with uh, the so-called eminent members having a veto against even the judges and things like that, which uh, ultimately got it got very unbalanced and not a correct way of choosing. Of course, I do realize that, that uh, uh, nowhere in the world do we have judges choosing judges. But then uh, we, we had, uh, we had uh, you see, uh, we had a background to this which everybody knows about the first judge's case, the second judge's case, and the third judge's case, and what happened to all, the, all these things. And uh, unfortunately, uh, that, that has weighed with us over the years. And, uh, we've, and, and certainly a national commission would do well. But if it was of the type which uh, Chief Justice Venkatachala had mentioned, uh, and that perhaps would have worked, because it would have a good mix with a, with a preponderance of the three senior most judges of the Supreme Court. And that is as it should be. Right, sir. Yeah. So you had s said something which also, which I wanted to ask you, that high profile lawyers who have political inclinations. Have who have? Political inclinations. Political inclinations. Yes. Yeah. And they have good argumentative skills. Yes. They are dangerous because they can defend all forms oh, of... Oh, yes, 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 quite right. They can defend autocratic rule. They can defend uh, democratic rule. Then they have done it all over the world. Okay. Uh, we have examples all over the world. 
So do you, like they were the three people who brought about the emergency, if you remember. Right, right, right. right. Uh, an emergency of 75. Right, sir. So do you think that the profession today has become much more commercial minded? Well, it's been driven to that. It's okay. been driven. It looks like it. It, it does. It has been. It has been. But I, I wouldn't say that uh, all lawyers are like that. It's not like that. There are, as, as in every walk of life, there are outstanding people in the law. There are outstanding people in politics. There are outstanding people in teaching and so on. But, uh, you, but you get uh, then. Uh, there's, 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 there's not. There doesn't remain outstanding. You see, there are. You can always throw, pick some holes in it. Right, sir. So my last question to you is that if you can just tell the audience what are the three good qualities they should have to be a good human being or a good lawyer, anybody who's pursuing this profession, if you can just let them. Well, a good human being. <laughs> or a good lawyer. A good lawyer, I don't know. A good lawyer, I think. Work, work and work is about the only, only thing that can make you a good lawyer. Okay, sir. And dedication to the cause and not, not be diverted, not be diverted by, with uh, all these uh, with, uh, un unnecessary ideas about how, 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 how best to structure the, the country. The country has been structured. We have a constitution. And nobody can ever devise another constitution for us. Nobody. It will never work. So, see, recently there's an example of Chile, which in South America, they, they were keen to have a new constitution. There was a big referendum and uh, on that constitution. They were very keen to have it. There was, it, it was, then they had people from abroad to come and draft a new constitution. They drafted it and then two-thirds of them rejected this. So they, they don't, still don't have a new constitution. So it's just not possible in a country of this dimension, of this size, of this uh, magnitude, and uh, of uh, this disparity that we have. And that's one of the heartening things about India, that it is not all, I mean, uh, languages are different, people think differently, people eat differently, people dress differently. And that's one of the great, great, great uh, qualities actually of, that makes it, makes India. So, so thank you so much. Oh no, for, thank you. Good for being on our show. No, no, thanks, thanks. And I hope you had a good time, sir. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. And I hope that you always stay as young as you are. Sir. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Okay, sir. A tireless protector of our rights and our liberties, inarguably a living legend, Pali Nariman. Law is a very disciplined uh, subject. It's a very trying profession, I must tell you. Nobody who's chicken-hearted can survive in this profession. You have to be lion-hearted, you have to be generous. Looking back, I don't regret it one bit. Palkiwala, our professor used to tell us, God pays, but not every week. my president, I must be frank. And as a lawyer, I'm expected not to mislead the court, the court of public opinion. Because frankly, I don't feel like one of the 25 global living legends. I'm afraid someone here or outside is going to name 25 others and he may well be right. Let me say only this, that if I have achieved anything in life, the lady behind me, not this one, the lady in front of me, <coughs> but in front of me, to whom I have been married 59 years, is responsible. Thank you very much. <laughs>